Okay, so let's take a look at our model here uh, that we're going to look at for the, the first demo. And we come to our toolbar. So we have a set of uh, buttons here that we can push. The user first defines the material. You notice you'll have conductivity, radiative conductivity, the delta, uh, atomic number, atomic weight, density, so things that go into the electromagnetic simulation and particle transport as well. So the user, user defines that. Uh, there's an option to define the boundary condition as well, uh, where you can set the potential set to some value for the whole simulation. Now they have the world parameters. Uh, the user defines a, a world box and a grid resolution parameter. Um, these are just things that help decide how finely to track the particles that are being deposited. They define the electromagnetic magnetic time steps, and uh, we also have um, a smoothing option. Then the user comes and defines the beam type. And so um, here we're going to look at a planar beam because that gives us a direct beam on this uh, slab. But in general, uh, the user has options. Here we've chosen one in the X-plane because you can see our material is set up in the X-plane or in the YZ-plane, so we want to beam along the X direction, and it's coming in the plus direction. That's, that's the direction we're going to have the particles fired from. And the, the program takes care of all of the dimensions of the beam based on the size of your problem. You just define the direction you want the beam to come from. The user has to define the material or assign the material. So here we've got material one. This is our dielectric. We've got some parameters. And then the user would uh, assign it to the right set. So in this case, we'd want to assign uh, to the magenta. And so that's called box one. We select material one and assign it. We would do that as well for the conductors. The user can look at their uh, world definition as well if they want as we come through these uh, the different buttons here. And lastly, we need to mesh our geometry. Now, uh, we have a mesh tool the user can use. It allows you to set the mesh size divisions. We also would uh, recommend a user to uh, learn how to use the mesh manager tool, the built-in tool from CatFix, which is, um, provides quite a bit of control over the simulation. This, our model's already meshed, and we'll show what it looks like here. Uh, we've got a really nice uh, fine mesh for this problem. We, uh, it's good to resolve these uh, in the X direction. It's good to resolve uh, pretty finely. The, the Y and Z, it's a little less crucial because uh, it, it's sort of uni it's uniform in those directions. Once the user's done this, uh, we have an output tool, and they'll specify the master set, which has all the geometry in it. And you can pick an option for verbosity to, for debugging purposes as well. Then we run this tool. And so this is creating geometry for the simulation at this point. So here's, what the, here's what's come out of this uh, output process. And in particular, we'll look at the summary messages. This is kind of the file the user would look at. This was just created by the program on the output. It's got information on the beam information on the bodies included, information on the elements, and things like that, so the user gets a, a feel for if everything looks right. Now the user can run the Viz tool, which allows for looking at the beam on a geometry. So this was our geometry, and it goes very fast. There's a command line option that allows the user to spend more time looking. Uh, you can take my word for it that the beam looks correct there. Although it goes so fast, you can't see it well, but there's a command line option for the Viz tool that allows the user to um, spend more time and customize how they want to view it. But once we are, trust our beam, we have one more thing to do, which is to specify the spectrum. And that's what this file right here is showing. You can see you have total number of particles filed, fired per time step, total time steps, total energies in the spectrum, the user uh, defines the total current incident, the duration, things like that. Here we're just doing one time step, and so the time duration doesn't matter. Uh, it's taken as constant when you just have one time step. But we'll show in the next example how the user can modify this spectrum for whatever they need to do. Um, 
But this file is it's the user supplies this file, spectrum.dat, and the program reads it in. So you can do something simple or complex, whatever you whatever you need to do. <coughs> okay, and so once we've gotten to this point, we can go ahead and run. We'll run our uh, we run our particle transport at this point. Now, the, this particle transport is running, and it produces this output file where the user can monitor the progress. So you can see it going. That's real time. Uh, it's running. I think it's a million. It's a million events on this slab, and it's about a you know, it's about a five minute process or so to do it all. Uh, that file that we talked about that it outputs shows some important information for the user. Uh, it shows the grid values. Uh, that are how, how it's dividing the problem up in XYZ. The smoothing choice, we chose not to smooth this problem. Um, it has some information on your spectrum, things like that. So in addition to tracking the output, you can see it here it was 9% complete. In addition to tracking that output, you can, uh, it's good to check this file, make sure you're simulating what you think you're simulating. So this is going to keep running. I paused the sim I paused the uh, demo to let it finish, uh, so that the user doesn't have to look at it all. But about five minutes later, or so it comes to the end of its run. Now what this simulation did was create these two files, uh, mesh.ric and mesh.source. Those are the files that go into the Elmer simulation for the electric field evaluation. So the user uh, just now goes to the next stage, which is to run the EM. Uh, we have a similar process here where uh, we have an output file. The user can track and set. Uh, you can either use like a notepad plus plus or uh, maybe if you have some kind of command line way to follow a, a file, whatever you want to do, you don't have to use the command line. You can just use uh, something that will update the file or just open and close it as you want. But whatever it is, it has the information on the progress of the simulation for the user. And this one will again pause uh, and so, or pause the demo so that it, you don't have to watch the whole simulation. But the um, this one takes about uh, 10 minutes to run. We're only running for 10 seconds though, just 10 time steps. So you can see six minutes left on that one. Okay, so once it's finished, we've only looked at a very brief simulation, but we can still look at the results and look at a comparison to a 1D model. So what we've done here is we've already loaded these results from the simulation using the Elmer post processor. So you can see now what the file, what the program does is creates this big data file that has the potential and the potential grad or the E field. The user can do whatever they want with that file. It, it's just a question of how you want to process it. Here we're just looking at it in three dimensions. Uh, we ran it out for we only ran it out for 10 seconds, <coughs> but this is what it looks like. And uh, you know, it's basically uh, it, it's an it's an interesting just to look at the problem. You can see that uh, you know, depending on how you ground this problem, it's going to have different results. But well, we've grounded it consistent with uh, Numit here. And now we run out the, uh, we have our own little tool here that lets us do a 1D plot of the E field. This is for comparison purposes. And this is the comparison between our result and Numit 2.0. It's for the 1D slab, and it matches up nicely. Um, and again, it depends on how the user wants to uh, process these results or what they want to do with them or how they want to set up their grounding. So we're almost to the end of this demo, and we're going to look now at we're going to look now at um, a modification on this, where we're going to implement uh, we're going to focus on the spectrum this time. So we'll use the same problem, but now we're going to allow the user to uh, have a spectrum that has some time dependence. So we're opening our spectrum file on an existing one that I already had available. So the one we did was on the right. Now we're going to add the one on the left. You can see 
What we've done is the same thing except we're adding three time steps and some, um, some spectrum of energy. So there's uh, the energy and the weighting at each time step. So we have five, five energies and a certain weighting that comes in. That, that column on the right is just the, the, the relative weighting. And then we have a two-second duration, a four-second duration, and a two-second duration. So it's, again, a 10-second simulation, but it's, uh, it's got three different time steps. So we'll do, do the same steps. All we've done here is modified the um, all we all we've done here is modify the spectrum. So uh, it's the same geometry. We just change our spectrum file and hit run again, and that's all we have to do. Uh, the user can again track it. Here it's a little slower because we have three time steps, each of a million events, and this one takes about 10 minutes to run once we've made it a little longer. But that's uh, showing the real-time um, development of this uh, transport simulation. So it runs pretty fast. It's pretty efficient. This model has, I think, about 33,000 nodes in it. And so um, it's overall pretty efficient for, uh, uh, for a model that does have, have a reasonable amount of nodes in it. So once that's finished, again, we will um, we can start our electromagnetic simulation, and that's going to take this charge density and charge, ener charge and energy deposition and turn that into uh, some electric field profile. And so, again, we'll have a look at our results. Um, it's basically, the only thing we've changed here is that we have um, put a time dependence in. So it's updated this case.ep file again. That's where all our results are stored. And then uh, we'll look at, at how the, the model evolves. You can't see much different, but the magnitude of these E-fields has changed. So it's a longer, it's a more intense spectrum, and it's, it's changed a little bit in time. And, uh, and so that's the difference here. So you have some higher energy and a higher higher level of incident current as well. So we'll do one more comparison to the 1D model. So again, uh, with with NUMIT, you can provide something similar, a time dependent spectrum. And so what we'll do now is compare how how this problem matches up with uh, a time dependence in our spectrum. Now here the agreement is not quite as one-to-one. Uh, -one. It's very close still. Um, there's a difference in how the interpolation is done in the NUMIT uh, analysis versus what ours does. The, um, you can see there's a little, just a little bit of a difference. There's, uh, the, the NUMIT interpolation is done as a, um, uh, it's done as a, uh, uh, like a delta function, a weighted delta function at each energy point, whereas ours is done as an actual interpolation between the energies, but it's pretty close. And it allows for some, probably some variation there. <coughs> okay, so we've looked at the, uh, we've looked at the, the, co the couple slab situations here, and now we're going to go and look at, um, we're going to look at a, a cable model, actually, so something that has So now we're going to look at something that actually has um, sort of a, the, the more traditional type 3D analysis, which is going to be a cable. So I'll open up our model again. And then this is uh, obviously we've already developed this model, but the user could again use the primitives and or possibly import models, whatever they needed to do. And we have, a, you know, we have a user manual that helps us see how to develop these models. But here we have a cable that's on a, uh, a ground plane. So you might have a cable routed on some metal plate that's exposed to the radiation environment. And, and what you can see is there's an outer conductor that's touching this ground plane. Then there's an inner dielectric. 
and then there's an inner uh, core conductor. So this is our model. Uh, the, the outer conductor is touching the plate at uh, that one spot at the bottom there. So they're just kind of resting on the plate right there at that one spot. Now here we've already gone through this model and defined things like the, the properties and the beam, but we'll run through a couple of the aspects of this problem still before we go on. <clears throat> so first you can see our mesh. The user could uh, use the mesh manager to make a mesh like this. Uh, so this one has nice resolution to it. That's, I think this model has um, maybe 10,000 nodes or something like that. Um, in this case, we're going to we're going to use an actually an isotropic beam. So this is a little more a little more consistent with. Um, so we've chosen a box beam that's isotropic. So the box means it goes around the whole geometry in the form of a box, and it's isotropic. So this is kind of consistent with with an AE9 spectrum, something that's isotropic. You don't have the advantage of of just narrowing your beam to a specific direction. You need to you need to simulate that stuff's coming from every direction. So and again, the, once the user runs this, they uh, the program automatically sets up the right dimensions of the beam. So we start running it again, uh, and it's the same process. We've uh, truncated the video so you don't have to see the whole thing run, and then we run the uh, electromagnetic part of this as well. So it's the same the same process. We just have a different geometry and a different beam. And again, the user supplies their spectrum. And so we've created the, the output file. Again, we have our uh, potential potential grad. And that's the, that's the result for the user, but we can look at these results as well uh, in the graphical way, just like we did before. And so that's what we've loaded up here. We've got our results shown this is the, uh, it's hard to see it, we're going to remove this body in a second so you can see better the scales. But the, um, this is the E-field in the X direction. Again, only 10 second run out, but it's for the isotropic spectrum we just looked at. So the field hasn't built up too much yet. It's about um, 1,600 volts per meter. And then that color shows the distribution in the material. So if we hide the, uh, the, the ground plane, it's a little easier to see. <coughs> And then we can watch the time development as well. Uh, so if we make the increments a little smaller here, run it out. And you can see this field uh, building up within the cable. Okay, so lastly, we'll look at a, a linear plot through the material. So again, we have our own processing tool we put together. We'll run that on the file and look at the, uh, the field. So in this case, we're kind of thinking, oh, our quantity of interest is really the E field in the X direction going up through the, through the cable. So X here is one of the, the direct cross-sectional directions going from the, it's the direction going from the conductor up. And so we plot the field going from the left side, is that where it touches the, the ground plane, and the right side is the top of the cable. So you can see that the areas where it's zero is where the conductive areas are, and then you have these, the two dielectric sections shown there. And so that's what we plot in these results. <clears throat> and I think that was, yes, and so that's the end of that demo. Okay, so we'll... Uh, Close that out. I think it's on repeat. Okay, so a couple final slides. So just a summary. Um, we tried to introduce the EMA 3D internal and show it on three uh, prototype problems uh, and all the steps. And really, the steps that were shown were um, that's that's really what's there. Uh, there is the user does have to develop the geometry. It takes some some work to do that, but. Once they have a geometry, everything is shown. And it's all GUI-based. Everything can be done from the GUI except for the post-processing. 
Uh, it's a unified platform, and, and it's, it's pretty efficient simulation-wise. I think uh, you saw in the real time how it was running. And for, for many problems, it'll run pretty smoothly, pretty uh, efficiently, I should say. Uh, again, the platform is flexible for geometry import, and, um, and it's, totally, it's totally flexible for the user spectrum as well. And that's what we wanted was something that would allow uh, the user to have flexibility on geometry and spectrum so that they can supply a real ephemeris or a real output from A9 and then incorporate this. And then we have the user manual. So, so some of the steps may have appeared to have been uh, not obvious during the first run through of the webinar, but uh, the user manual guides it, guides it all through. And, and most of these analyses were done just uh, within an hour this morning, or not this morning, yesterday afternoon, but most of it was done within about an hour, running through all the steps and everything once the geometry is developed. So that's the end of our webinar, and uh, we thank you for joining. We have also time for questions. You can submit your questions via chat now or, or even hopefully during the webinar, and then uh, we'll try to answer as many as we can. You can also email us or uh, there's a form at the end of the webinar you can fill out.